Good morning, everyone. My name is John Farmer, and I am the director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics. And I have the pleasure this morning of welcoming all of you uh, to this year's Louis J. Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series program, and to our guest speaker today, Andrew Peng. Presented by Eagleton since 2012, the Louis J. Gambaccini Civic Engagement Series is designed to promote civic engagement through a discussion of timely and enduring issues of great significance with the objective of generating real civil discourse and action. The Gambaccini series was established through the generous support of Lou Gambaccini's family, friends, and colleagues to honor his outstanding legacy in public service and his lifelong dedication to upholding the highest standards of civic responsibility, always striving and inspiring others to leave communities better, more efficient, more beautiful than they found them. Past speakers in this series have included the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter, Black Voters Matter, Latosha Brown, President Andrea Jenkins, the Director of Social, Culture, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, Dr. Yubal Levin, New York Times ethicist and NYU professor Kwame Anthony Appiah, political ed editor Carrie Woodoff Brown, Congressman John Lewis, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor. I'm so thrilled to end Andrew Peng's voice this distinguished list today. We're emphasizing this year the importance of youth and youth activism uh, in our politics. And I want to take this moment to especially thank the Gamagini family and supporters of this series for making conversations, and we hope inspirations like this possible. Lou Gambaccini had a distinguished career in public service for a long time at the difficult environment, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and as the Secretary of Transportation under Governor Brendan Byrne, he's one of the founders of New Jersey Transit, uh, and he spent his life dedicated to making our lives better. Finally, I want to recognize and thank the Institute's co-sponsors for this afternoon's dialogue, including the Rutgers Asian American Cultural Center, Rutgers Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, Rutgers Center for Social Ed Justice Education in LGBTQ Communities, and Rutgers School of Communication and Information. Andrew Pang, our guest today, is a communications associate at OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates and the co-founder of the YAPI, a nationally recognized publication that covers policy news and activism affecting Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. A San Diego, California native <clears throat> who was raised on the East Coast, Andrew graduated from Rutgers University, New Brunswick in May, 2021, the pandemic year, with a BA in communications and political science. He co-founded the YAPI while balancing his student commitments at Rutgers, a real testament to the opportunity and energy of youth political participation. Prior to joining OCA full-time in June, Andrew interned with a variety of government agencies and nonprofits in Washington including the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Educational Technology and Asian Americans Advancing Justice. On campus, he managed public relations for the 2021 MARC Conference and served as a communications intern at Rutgers Leadership and Experiential Learning. A member of the Asian American Journalists Association, Andrew's work and coverage of AAPI politics has been featured in Politico Playbook, Yahoo News, and elsewhere. I'd also like to introduce our moderator this morning, my equal colleague, Jessica Ronan. As program manager for the Center for Youth Political Participation, Jessica is responsible for implementing the Are You Voting and Are You Ready programs, and she's done a phenomenal job. In that role, she recruits and works with a team of in interns and students, develops materials for each program, facilitates the Center's event series during the semester, and curates the Center's social media and website content. Additionally, she's the administrator of the Rutgers Eagleton Washington Inter Internship Award program, a donor supported award program supporting undergraduate students interested in interning in Washington, D.C. over the summer. And she is also a proud Rutgers alum. Thank you, Jessica, for leading today's discussion. Before we launch into today's uh, program, I want to encourage our audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box throughout the discussion for special selection in the latter half of the program. Andrew, thank you so much for your virtual visit to Eagleton and, and welcome back. Uh, to Rutgers University. I'll now turn the program over to our moderator, Jessica Ronan. Thank you so much, John, for that wonderful introduction and good morning, everyone. And welcome back, Andrew, to the virtual banks on the old Raritan. We're so lucky and so happy to have you here this morning. Um, I wanna just get us started with some questions. And as a reminder, if you have any during the event, please drop them in our Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so first I wanna just get started and ask you a little bit about what initially sparked your interest in politics, specifically politics dealing with the Asian American and Pacific Islander community? Would you consider yourself civically engaged before the founding of the Yappy? And if you had to do so, did you have any mentors that were really instrumental in guiding that interest? 
Yeah, so first off, um, thank you to everyone who, who made this opportunity possible, obviously to Eagleton, to John for the invite, to you, Jessica and Max, and the Gamachini family. Um, I'm gonna answer that in flip side, actually. So I'd say, yes, I was um, civically engaged before I founded the Yappy in 2018. So I've been involved in politics sort of since high school. So um, my first step was really um, sort of doing communications for a board of education candidate in Westboro, um, in, yeah, Westboro, Plainsboro. Ugh. West Windsor, Plainsboro. Um, and, you know, I did, I did free, um, you know, just graphic design for that candidate, social media. And I realized, you know, these types of candidates don't have that many volunteers. There's, you know, all the hype is in the national races, you know, maybe state legislative politics, but, you know, these candidates are really under-resourced and especially Asian candidates are under-resourced. So the first, the first one I interned, um, or not interned, but what, you know, sort of worked with was Chinese American. Um, and from there I was like, you know, that, that volunteer campaign bug sort of bit me. And um, I stumbled upon something called the High School Democrats of America. Um, first, I joined their uh, sort of New Jersey branch, um, and it helped that um, in high school, the, the, the co-founder of, of our New Jersey chapter, Elon Berger, was also a high school student with me. So uh, I, I sort of did communications there as well. You, you can see a trend line coming. Um, and then eventually I, you know, this was my first opportunity sort of to go to DC. And um, so the High School Democrats of America sort of gave me the opportunity to sort of, you know, visit the DNC, get to understand, you know, and meet some politicians and, you know, sort of, it just went uphill from there. Um, in the 2016 cycle, I became the national communications director for the High School Democrats of America. That was during the 2016 cycle. Um, so went to the Democratic National Convention, got even more hyped you know, saw where the work was going, you know, really, really incredible stuff was happening with student organizers in particular, in particular because once you realize that you, when you start doing the work and you see the research, you realize that high school students in particular are, these, these are the years where they actually develop, um, you know, their belief systems and how they approach life. And so knowing that, um, that sort of launched me into just, you know, continuing campaigning, um, interning at places and, when I got to high school, um, when I got to college, I was like, by that time, I was like, you know, this is, I, I've peaked. So um, I was, this is where I started to transition and think about, you know, life beyond just politics. And that first summer, um, my freshman year in Rutgers, I was like, you know, I'm going to apply to a bunch of places, see what would happen. And I was particularly interested in, in sort of government and service. Um, so this is a transition of where I would say, you know, campaigning is hard. But going into and serving is actually harder. And I wanted to get that sense of, you know, what am I fighting for in DC? What am I fighting for in national politics is, is actually the governance part. Um, so I landed my first internship at the US Department of Education um, in a small office called the Office of EdTech. Um, so that was sort of a tech policy office. You know, it dealt with really interesting things from just, you know, open access to educational resources to things like the digital divide. And also focused on like some, some emerging things like Bitcoin. Um, and, 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 you know, crypto. So that really got me even hyped even more. And it also gave me a perspective on just, you know, the importance of service, because once you put aside, you know, any partisanship or, or, you know, any belief system, and you just put the service aspect to it, then you realize how important it is to have good, good folks in government. And, you know, people need to serve in, in, in government because there aren't that many folks, you know, that, there's a, there's a belief system that, you know, people go into government, they'll just stay there forever. Um, and that it, you know, there is a real age gap um, and tech gap. So the more people that need to get involved is, is what, you know, I was told. So that's a bit about just the civic engagement part of my, um, I guess, development. Um, when I came to Rutgers, the part about me that hit me about Asian American politics was actually through a course called Asian American Identity and Politics. And um, part of the class curriculum was reading a book called The History of the Making of Asian America. Um, it's a book by Erica Lee. And, you know, as someone who didn't really learn about Asian American history growing up, you know, obviously with, with the curriculum wasn't adapted to that way. And so this was my first time at least reading about the history of Asian America and just like, you know, our, our place in the American society, right? Um, so I learned that basically Asian Americans are I guess we can call them the, they have experienced the quintessentially American experience because we've been, Asian Americans have been exploited for labor, have been discriminated against and have, you know, have been at the same time viewed in some cases as sort of 
um, you know, the quote unquote model minority, which is, you know, they've been touted as the best of society. Um, and so seeing that I would, that was really where I was like, you know, discovering, you know, my own identity and also the fact that, you know, I was sort of, you know, sort of not mad, but I was really disappointed that I didn't learn about any of this until, you know, I took that class. Um, and then also this was at a time when I, I'm, I've always been a news junkie and I've always been interested in either, you know, pursuing journalism and communication. So I was like looking for sources of news on Asian Americans. And, you know, when you look at, when you Google search Asian Americans, you won't see that much. You'll probably, if you're lucky, um, you know, the issues that you see are in an education lens. Um, and that is not, you know, even close to the experiences that, that reflect, that reflect Asian America. And so also I realized that the e-news ecosystem, you know, Asian Americans have so few sources to go through for our own personal news. Like there are, there's, yes, there's ethnic media, but English language, you know, um, very, you know, nuanced um, coverage is very lacking. Um, so that's sort of why I took that step in learning more about our history. So I'm not an expert on Asian American history or anything. It's just that, you know, it's a learn to learn experience. Um, and then to your point on mentors, um, I've been very lucky to have really great mentors. Um, I started back in high school. I had two really great teachers. Um, one was Mr. Daniel Ippolito, um, who was my AP Gov teacher. And the other one was um, Ernest Cunha, who was my AP US history teacher. And they really encouraged me to do a lot of things. Um, they, you know, I told them about, you know, doing, being civically involved and they, they gave me opportunities. For example, they had me join um, my local Congress's Men's Youth Council. Um, and then they also sort of, they opened the opportunity for me to go to something called American, well, New Jersey Boys State, um, which is a program for, um, you know, certain juniors, I think, in high school who, who get development and leadership and how to vote and things like that. Um, so I think those are the two key ones. The other ones in just terms of Asian American um, activism is, I would say, my boss at uh, the U.S. Department of Education, Sharon Liu, um, she taught me about uh, her, her time at the U.S. Department of Labor, where she was one of the only Asian Americans there. And she said, you know, that she talked about her presence there and, and how it frustrated her. And then at Rutgers, you know, I'd obviously say my, the, the Asian American studies professor, and as well as, um, you know, the folks who mentored me at uh, Rutgers Leadership and Experiential Learning, which I think they changed their names. But um, when I was at Rutgers, I had Jordan Shi, who was interim director um, Robin Janice, who, who was also, who was previously director before she left. And um, so I would consider those really great folks. Thank you so much for that. And it's wonderful to hear the role that, you know, the role that high school players, high school students can really play in politics and the need for more diverse voices. And it's also great to hear all the little Rutgers shout outs as well. So for our Rutgers attendees, uh, get involved with the Office of Experiential Learning. They're a really great resource for you. So I wanna really transition, really talk about the development of the Yappy. We have a lot of mm -hmm. students on this call specifically. So if you can tell us a little bit about how you went through that process of developing the Yappy, especially as a busy college student, especially during a pandemic. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you wanna share a little bit about that and maybe touch on maybe one challenge that you faced, was it spreading the word? Was it getting legitimacy, things like that? So that'd be great to hear. Yeah. So. Um... I'd say that the first idea came, so if folks don't know, um, 2018, 2019 was the time when uh, a lot of Facebook groups um, specifically for Asians started popping up. So I'm talking about like Settle Asian Trade, Settle Asian Dating, and there was sort of a cohesiveness that was starting to form, like a lot of digital networks were forming and a lot of memes were being shared at the same time. Um, and so I saw that as an opportunity to sort of um, to start launching this project just because, you know, it felt like there was a community that was out there and there's a lot of untapped potential. And, you know, once you see the numbers in these Facebook groups, you're like, wow, you know, this could, this is finally like sort of a visualization of how many folks are, are out there. Um, so I had a high school, friend, uh, actually a friend I met in middle school who's also named Andrew. Um, and we got together, hopped on a call, and we were like, you know, strategizing. And um, basically we came up with the name um, Yappy in, I think, November, 2018, um, after, CSO, the Chinese student organization had bought um, a YouTube duo called Wang Fu Productions to campus. And those are two Asian YouTube, like a bunch of Asian YouTubers who were like the OG. So a lot of you know, folks grew up with them. Um, and they had launched a series called The Yappy earlier, um, whose, whose main character is named Andrew as well, um, who, who 
you know, I, I sort of see myself within it, but it's like, it's, it talks about a software engineer um, who sort of, you know, realizes his place in a society and that he, he doesn't want to be just, you know, a quote unquote yuppie, um, but Asian. Um, so we came with, we put that name down, we bought the domain name, and then we started doing sort of um, research, market research on how, you know, what folks actually wanted. So, you know, I went on LinkedIn uh, and Facebook and just, you know, started DMing random people and, and asking people if they would read a newsletter. Like we came up with a draft. Um, originally, we were going to cover like business, uh, culture, celebrities. And it was like, at, at some point, you get enough feedback to tell where uh, you can't fit you can't satisfy everyone right um and also the fact that like you know i'm we're only two people we don't have a lot of capacity so what can we what can we focus on that actually needs attention i think that you know once you look at the ecosystem there's lots of places you can get information about you know asian american representation in hollywood but not a lot of places where you can see you know asian american and asian americans in politics um so after that market research we just you know literally built on email list from just a few names of just people we who we asked wanted to be on it. So it was a very small list in general. Um, and interestingly, we never promoted at Rutgers. We have never promoted in a student population. Um, we actually just grew towards, you know, word of mouth. So I just tell when I went to DC, for example, for my internship, I would just, you know, say, hey folks, you know, this is a project you might want to look into. Um, and also, word of mouth is great because um, I find that it, 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 it's an organic audience. It's an app, it's not an that actually cares. Um, mm-hmm. So we've never spent a dollar or a cent on ad money. We've never promoted on social media that much. Um, so it, it's all word of mouth. And I'd say the challenge of that is, obviously, who are you reaching? Who's your target audience? You get that question a lot. And I think that for us, at least, growing that strong audience, first of all, just through word of mouth was key because... Um, you understand, you start discovering like little niches of people. Um, so our content was sort of gravitating towards like a very DC professional class. Um, but it was also like, you could see the network um, in MailChimp of like folks growing out and expanding. And then that's when you can see the reach um, and where your potential target market is. So that's why we chose that approach instead of just, you know, posting on Facebook and hope and spending ad dollars because word of mouth is powerful. Definitely. And was there any sort of challenges that you faced besides the word of mouth advertising? Was there one challenge mm-hmm. maybe as a, as a student that you dealt with, like when, you know, trying to build this content, trying to navigate being a student at Rutgers, other extracurricular activities as well. Uh, but mm-hmm. just like one challenge in that way that you faced as a student. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's tough work. It, it, you know, there was a point where I was, you know, each newsletter is so long to write. Um, it takes like, Every time I, I like, we, we used to send newsletters at like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And obviously that's a wrong thing to do now that you think about it for the audience purposes, but that was when we would do it. And I did sacrifice, you know, time on schoolwork. And, and I did, spend, I, will, I will tell, you know, my bosses after the fact that, um, you know, I did spend some time in the office when I was supposed to be working, doing, doing newsletter stuff. Um, I, can, I can say that one time I was like, you know, I was calling, um, Elizabeth Warren, when she ran for president, she had an API, API director, um, and I was calling her during my office hours. So I definitely did, um, you know, take some time that I sh- technically should have had, but, you know, this was, it's tough to run something like this and balance a lot of the sport because I was traveling to every single campus every week and going to classes and et cetera. So yes, it's very tough, but you have to s- just figure out your priorities. If you want to care about schoolwork, care about schoolwork. If you, if you can have some wiggle room you know I had some wiggle room just because I thought that most of the classes were just you know essay based or or things like that and so I did have have a bit of time to write but it gets very grueling so you know I would spend hours at a time either just sitting in the Livingston Student Center or at the dining hall just you know typing away so it can get lonely yeah and the Livingston uh, Student Center is a pretty decent place to work as well as I can say as a former student but uh, as another person who also writes a newsletter it is a lot of work to harness all that material and content so I could definitely sympathize Um, so it was really wonderful hearing about just like that thought process of this development and now I want to more specifically think about the role of media so we've seen in the past decade that media has played a greater role in understanding and shaping news So in your opinion, what's the responsibility of media when it comes to understanding and participating in our democracy? And you can take this in the approach of like 
media that's on social media. That's where a lot of, we're seeing a lot of young people get their news from Twitter, from Facebook, from other insights on social media, or just traditional media in general. Yeah, I think I can tackle both. So I think there's an actually interesting way in, in which I think the, at least younger Asian Americans consume media. Um, it's a lot of Instagram heavy, um, you know, just slideshows. And I think at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of just the fact of like, you know, hate crime awareness was spread through Instagram for, you know, people were posting graphic videos and, and lots of, lots of, you know, very intense imagery. Um, so there is a discussion to have of obviously like, what is the responsibility of promoting this type of content and posting it is in the public interest. Um, I approach, we approach at least this way of like, you have to put the audience first and the, the focus should be on both educating slash informing and then also giving them the tools to sort of understand how to participate in the democracy that we have. Um, so when we started the Yappy, for example, um, one of the, we've, we've always put sort of the service aspect in, in perspective. Um, so we created, for example, a guide for um, Asian American interns in DC. So we would, you know, talk about how you get housing, how you get you know, things like that. Um, and it's also the role of media to shape how, not shape, but like provide perspective on certain issues that otherwise aren't really covered. So, you know, this is a challenge within, I think, the Asian community as well, because there, there is a certain lack of the media literacy because there haven't been, um, you know, the publications out there to, to clarify things. So, you know, when we talk about like issues like immigration, abortion, you know, housing, poverty, those don't immediately come to mind as like Asian issues because you think of a affirmative action, for example, just an education issue. But, you know, when you actually meet out the activists, when you, you look at the actual data, you see that these are very niche issues that have huge impacts on our community. It's just that no one really hasn't, well, not no one, but like it hasn't been you know, covered a lot. So through that perspective, it's important not to inform, but also educate and sort of empower. So that's why our slogan is Inform and Empower, because we want to add that um, empowerment factor. And then social media as well, you know, I talked a bit about the graphic nature, um, you know, deciding whether you want to share content, it's, it's a very um, sensitive issue. So what we do is just, you know, evaluate. We have friends at, for example, um, publications like Next Shark, which did publish a lot of graphic material. And so we just reach out to them and say, you know, we're here to help if you ever need it. But we wouldn't, for example, we wouldn't publish graphic content really um, ourselves. Um, we wouldn't really share that. It's 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 a very um, it's a very sensitive issue because you know it is graphic. Yes, definitely. And I I often think that you know we don't learn how to read news often. Not we're not taught that in schools, especially for a, the elder older populations. Even for somebody myself who went to school in the early two thousands, we didn't learn how to read news at that time. You basically just read the page, whatever it was. You never were taught mm -hmm. to think about. Where, where, may, where might this perspective be coming from? How might these other policies and events be um, influencing that perspective as well? Um, so I think it's really important and invaluable that you mentioned like the education, the perspective and other um, efforts that the media plays in kind of shaping the news and shaping how people respond to politics. Yeah, so, I, I, will, I will just note one more thing. Like obviously, um, you know, misinformation has been a hugely big, you know, just topic. It's a hot topic in general. Um, and I'd say that it, it, it affects Asian communities in particular because, you know, because of the lack of the media ecosystem, a lot of, a lot of misinformation is shared through, for example, um, you know, apps like WeChat, WhatsApp, et cetera. And a lot of, a lot of at least ethnic media do have, you know, partisan alignment or, or they'll, you know, there's just a lot of just, you know, BS to be frank. Um, so that, that's sort of also why you have to just teach people, not teach people how to read news, but sort of help them understand that that kind of news is shouldn't be the only um, thing to be consumed. Definitely. And, you know, especially thinking about, you know, the increase in hate crimes that we've seen in the past year, there's been a huge influx of hate crimes against the AAPI community because of the pandemic. Um, how can more individuals, in your opinion, advocate and become an ally for members of the AAPI community? And if so, do you have any resources that we can share, um, especially for student for students, for older people as well? Um, but we want to be able to advocate for our students to become advocates for this community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there's a plenty of things that you can do to support um, just the communities that are involved. Um, so, for example, 
Um, the most direct thing, at least in, hate, in terms of hate crimes, is, is what we call bystander intervention training. So what can you do to help a person who's being sort of, you know, harassed or victimized, um, for example, in your daily life? So if you see something, if you see someone getting, you know, being targeted by, you know, someone who, who is spewing hateful remarks or actually assaulting them, um, there are bystander intervention trainings available. Um, so, for example, my organization, OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates, we host a monthly training called SAW, um, which is sort of just breaks down how to how to intervene when you see something. There's also a separate bystander intervention training offered by uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice and a, a, a group called Hollaback. Um, so I can obviously direct you to that as well. Then the second thing is just, you know, raising awareness of the issues. So, you know, follow folks, you know. Follow our coverage, for example, but there's also great resources um, elsewhere. For example, um, right after, I think this year actually, um, there's a there's a group called the Asian American Foundation that was established um, basically by a bunch of, of corporate titans um, to sort of pool money and resources together. And they have a great uh, anti-Asian toolkit that basically informs not only just folks on the ground, but you know, activists and policymakers as well on how to, you know understand what's happening. So there's a big toolkit online that I can also direct folks to. Um, and then finally, you know, I know that we're all, you know, most people, are, most college students can't afford to give money, but if you can, you know, there's plenty of nonprofits out there that could use some dollars. Um, otherwise they are reliant on sort of other, you know, either grants or corporate funding. And it's good to have grassroots funding from folks who are actually um, interested in supporting our communities. Wonderful, thanks. And we'll be able to share all those resources. And just as a reminder for everybody, um, please feel free to drop any questions you may have um, to Andrew in the chat or within the Q&A function. Um, and we'll be able to answer those live. Especially we wanna give another thank you as well to Professor uh, Stacey Green's class, who's also participating in this lecture this afternoon. Uh, so please, please drop your questions in the chat uh, or the Q&A function and we'll be able to answer them live uh, today during our sessions. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have a few more, just a few more questions about how has the Yappy really shaped your understanding of politics and the role you play as a citizen? And if you have like a message that you want to share with current Rutgers students, we have a lot of students who want to get involved in our democracy, but they don't know how. So what would be your best advice in the first place to get started? Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, I'm a huge procrastinator. I will, I will say that very proudly. Um, you know, I think in college was especially shown that. Um, so I think there is a point where you just have to do it. Um, you have to take that leap of faith and do whatever you need to do. Um, and so, for example, if you want to be civically involved, you know, the first thing doesn't have to be you you register to vote and actually vote. It can be, you know, things like either signing a petition, which, you know, obviously has its own um, dynamics to it. You can read, you know, news. You can um, also get involved. There's a lot of clubs obviously at Rutgers, probably, you know, too many to name um, from all political stripes, all partisanships, even, you know, you know democratic socialists, you got, you know, the conservative union. So there is a home for you anywhere you go. Uh, you just have to find it. And it doesn't take that much work. You just have to think about, you know, what you personally want to believe in or what you believe in and just pick, pick a route to go. Um, and then I also say that registering vote is very easy, um, you know, when I was at Rutgers, I always voted by mail. Um, it's incredibly easy in New Jersey. California, you can track your ballot and they are they automatically mail you the ballot. So take the opportunity you have um, because you live in a state that gives, you know, pretty good, has a pretty good electoral system um, to sort of use it to, your, to just exercise your rights. And then finally, if you, if you don't even have to consider your own beliefs, just think about, you know, things at Rutgers and that affect you. You know, the term bill, you know, fees, all that stuff. You know, it, it, it hits you in the pocket sometimes. And these are things you have to care about. Um, and that is the result of politics and, you know, the, the institutions that run them. So as long as you care about that, you, you, there's plenty of ways to get involved. Thank you. And I think that you had another part in that question that I, yeah, I probably glossed yeah. over. No worries, no worries. And I think it's great for students to really hear that it's not just voting, it's other things as well. I think all people can hear that. It's not just voting. That's the first step. There's a lot of other steps that you can take after that. And even if you're not going to be able to vote, um, there's other ways that you can get involved in politics. Uh, the other part of that question was, uh, how has the Yappy uh, shaped your understanding and your role you play as a citizen? Yeah, um, so I think... 
you know, when you really look at it, the word Asian American, you know, we, we use it as sort of a racial identifier today. You know, it's used sort of as a demographic label, but the term Asian American actually didn't exist until 1968. Um, it was created by two UC Berkeley graduate students um, as a way of, it was a political term. It was completely made up um, by these two students to unite sort of the Chinese, Japanese, and um, Filipino students. Um, this was during, you know, the height of the civil rights movement, um, protests against Vietnam, things like that. And so this was also when, you know, things like ethnic studies were starting to be debated. And these two students, at least at UC Berkeley, realized, you know, we can't stay separate um, as, as, you know, different groups from different nationalities. We have to sort of combine to create political power. So they based that label um, based, you know, from inspiration from the Black Power Movement. And then you can see slowly that, you know, no one actually really used that term until um, I'd say the 1980, yeah, 82. Um, that was the murder of Vincent Chin, um, who was an auto worker, not an auto worker, but he was a Chinese American who was killed by um, two auto workers in, De in Detroit, Michigan. Um, this was a time during, you know, there's a lot of Jap anti-Japanese sentiment um, and, you know, these, these folks didn't care that he was Chinese. They thought he was Japanese and they killed him because he looked sort of the same. So that's when, you know, folks started realizing uh, you, you have to unite, you have to show solidarity um, to promote and sort of protect your own civil rights and civil liberties. Otherwise, you know, the numbers are so small that you don't have much political power. Um, and this was a very revolutionary and radical idea at the time because prior to, I'd say, yeah, the 1980s, 1960s, uh, different ethnic groups, different nationalities, like the Chinese and Japanese, actually didn't get along and they didn't, you know, like each other. For example, you know, when the Chinese Exclusion Act was up for renewal in the early 1900s, Japanese Americans really didn't, you know, it wasn't their issue. So they didn't speak up. When, when Japanese internment happened, Chinese and Korean Americans actually wore stickers that were differentiating themselves from Japanese folks. And, you know, it's all about proximity to sort of what we call the white, you know, whiteness and, and power, the power structures that happened there. Um, and you can see that, you know, without solidarity, really bad things happen. So that's sort of what um, starting the Yappy taught me is that, you know, everything matters. And, you know, terms like Asian American are so powerful because they're, they're political in nature. Um, and for me, at least, it gives me a new re reflection on, you know, I can't take anything for granted. Um, no one can take anything for granted in that, you know people fought for your rights and it's important to honor that. And I think that's such a perfect way to end our guided questions that we have for the event today. So thank you so much for sharing all of so many interesting points um, this during this conversation that we've just had. And I wanna just get and open it up to our Q&A. So for those who are unsure or don't know how to post in the Q&A, there is a function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, chat is disabled, so please just drop it into the Q&A button um, and we will be able to get to it. We might not get to everybody's question, uh, but we're gonna really try. Uh, so we wanna just start it off with our first question. Um, this is from Shay Dolan. Um, you brought up the concept of the model minority. And I think that this is especially interesting at this time, because as you mentioned, there's been an increased representation of the Asian community in movies and media recently. However, the Asian community is dealing with discrimination and hate crimes following COVID. How do you feel that Asians are viewed today in America and where do they fall in the model minority? Yeah, so there's a concept actually called um, racial triangulation. So this was a perspective of, of just how Asian Americans were viewed in terms of whiteness and, you know, in terms of how African Americans were treated in the system. Um, so, you know, throughout American history, Asian Americans, at least, you know, for example, Chinese Americans were, were exploited for their labor. Um, you can see in the early railroads, like the transcontinental railroads, those were mostly built by Chinese labor. And then in the final picture, you don't even see, like when they, they, they sort of put in the final, final um, steps of that, they erased them completely, they fired all the workers. So you only see white workers in the final picture of the completion of the transcontinental railroad. Um, so you can see that they're exploited, they're erased. And then at certain times when it, you know, it comes to, you know, almost beneficial to sort of uplift Asians, for example, Chinese Americans um, at one time were viewed as honorary whites. Um, so they didn't get the full privileges, but there were newspapers and politicians that were saying that they were better than African-Americans and Native Americans. Um, and sort of using them to pit each other, each group together against each other. Um, so that's why it's so important to realize that 
the model minority is a term that is despised because, you know, it's using Asian Americans as sort of a wedge, um, sort of, you know, to be like, look at these Asian folks, they're so good at society, you know, you don't, you, you actually have it better. Um, we have a good. So um, in terms of media representation, obviously it's great to see that, but representation is in everything, right? Um, just because, and also I, I'd say that current Asian American representation, representation is terrible because it's mostly East Asian, right? You don't see a lot of Southeast Asians or South, South Asians. Um, it's mostly, you know, Chinese and Korean and Japanese. So even that has a long way to go. Thank you so much. And thank you for that question as well. Um, so we have another question from somebody who wants to know, um, is the Yappy for profit? Um, has Andrew thought about how to get revenue to support the growth of their site and newsletter? I should add that the newsletter is very well written. That was not me. I agree that it's very well written, <laughs> but that was an attendee, so. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we actually thought about this. Um, right now, we're deciding to pursue a nonprofit route. Um, so we currently, we actually just signed an agreement with the Asian American Journalists Association to be a fiscal sponsor, um, I think like last week or two weeks ago, and we're going to pursue um, a nonprofit status. And with that obviously comes how you get revenue. Um, so we, we obviously rely through mostly reader donations, um, because currently the only costs are for our website. We don't, we don't pay writers. We don't, I don't pay myself. You know, I get, I get zero dollars off of this. Um, it all goes towards the website, um, but we actually did start applying for grants. We got one um, from something called the Solutions Journalism Network. So over the next year, we're going to be starting to cover um, things like Southeast Asian deportations, um, how the Republican Party is attracting um, Asian American voters, um, and things like that. Um, so we got grant funding for that, um, and we're applying to a lot of other grants. Now that we have the fiscal sponsorship status, that gives us the ability to accept tax deductible donations and also get better accounting. So, um, you know, hopefully that we'll, we'll find more ways to make money. Um, it is, we, we finally have that as a priority um, and hopefully we will be able to raise enough at least for the next year to start paying our writers. Great, and it's wonderful to hear about all the different areas of growth as well for, your, for the organization and for the YAPI. Um, so I'm going to go to another question that we have. We have a ton of questions coming in. So keep them coming in, everybody. Um, do you have any advice on how to remain an unbiased news source when speaking on issues you are passionate about? How do you keep your opinions from influencing how you write? Or do you think your opinions should shine through your work? Well, it depends. Um, we've published a few pieces that are in certain perspectives. Um, for example, after Atlanta, um, our editorial director, Shauna Chen, wrote an article on like Asian women and fetishization and sort of um, violence against Asian women. And so in terms of, you know, I don't know if we can say anything is sort of unbiased. I think that, you know, even the language um, that we use is inherently biased and you can't avoid that. Um, and then also, I think that there's a false narrative that everyone should have balance, like, you know, the facts are facts, right? Um, you know, there is a certain way you can frame things, but at the end of the day, uh, what I rely on at least is just, is this real? Is this factual? Um, and in, in a way that presents the coverage. Um, and then also it comes down to talking to Brazilian people. Like for example, you know, if I, if I want, I don't, I don't feel comfortable, for example, writing on Pacific Islander politics unless I talk to someone, if I have to, you know, look at source material, et cetera. Um, these things have to be heavily researched. Um, and just comes out of a lot of just talking to folks from both parties. Um, but again, I, I don't think that necessarily, you, the words unbiased and sort of balanced are sort of very tricky because I don't think they're necessarily good and also necessarily like, you know, what's fair versus um, what's just. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I agree, it's a, definitely a very fine line that. Uh, journalists has to um, have to um, keep their mindset in. So appreciate sharing on that a little bit more. Um, now I want to get to a student question that we have that came in. So oftentimes I've kind of crossed students that didn't vote because they didn't think they had the time to go to the voting booth on election day. Oh, this is my favorite type of question. Mm. What would be your advice to students that say their schedules are too busy for voting and for other forms of civic engagement? And that could be, you know, expressive engagement. It can go mean uh, going to protest, uh, you know, running for office as well. Um, and I'm going to pair that with, do you have any thoughts of running for office one day? That was another question that came in. So I'll pair those two. 
<laughs> okay, I'll put so for the one on voting. I mean, there's no, there's really no excuse not to vote because, I mean, I voted by mail. Like, I got my ballot in the mail. I just read through it. I, I like left my ballot on the on my dorm desk for weeks before I actually voted. And you know, it's very easy. It's just you put it in the envelope, you sign it, and then you, it's done. And um, you don't have to go to the polls physically um, in New Jersey. And then also, just in terms of other civic engagement, I mean, you don't have to go to pro. I don't. I think that there's too much. Um, I think at least in our generation, there's too much comparison to each other. Like people are like, oh, I'm so civically engaged. I'm so active. Like you're not like, ha ha. There's too much sort of, I'd say gatekeeping and almost elitism ingrained within it. I don't think that you have to go to a protest and sort of actively, it's good to show protest, you know, support for a movement, but you don't have to go to a protest or do it like, you know, a very public thing, especially if you're, you know, for example, an introvert like me, like I, I didn't, when I went to protest, I didn't go as an attendee. I just went as a photographer, for example, cause I like photography. Um, you don't have to do these things. Um, all that matters is that you either, you know, voting is very important because it is, it is the thing that you're, everyone talks about. It's the thing that holds the most power. But speaking out, you, you don't have to, you know, don't put too much expectation on yourself to compare yourself to others. Um, you, you have your own level of enjoyment and, and civic ed- engagement. Um, it's all up to you. So, and then finally, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not going to run for office. I'll never run for office, probably. I think I'm, I'm better at, working to support people who are running for office, but I wouldn't run myself. Well, we heard it here first, everybody. Uh, Andrew Pang will not be running for office. Uh, so what's, that's great. And I agree with you that it's often, you know, I would, myself included, I would not, I'm not the type of person that would go to a protest. I just, I'm also an introvert. I think that'd be overwhelming mm-hmm. for me. And I think there's a lot of different ways that you can express that power. And there should be less elitism of, oh, I'm, I did four internships with this congressperson. I voted this year. I went to that protest. I think activism can be seen in a lot of different routes and really harnessing those passions in a way that you're comfortable and is the most authentic for yourself is really important as well. So I'm glad you reached, uh, spoke on that. Now we have a few more questions that have come in. Um, so this one, do you feel that there is enough Asian Americans represented in politics right now and holding government and official positions? Um, and if so, how are more ways that we can encourage those candidates to run for office? I know just to give a little shout out to the Center for American Women in Politics, if you're looking to learn a little bit more about women, um, diverse women who are currently running and serving in office, they're a great resource. We have at Eagleton, but I'll let Andrew speak on that as well. I agree with that. I, I think the Center for Women in American Politics is great. Um, I, I think the, an- the short answer is no. Um, clearly, it's not even close. For example, you know, let's just take federal politics. Um, I think... I think to be proportional um, to just the Asian American population, for example, the Senate would have to have like four to six Asian American senators, and there are currently two. And then the House is even more abysmal. Um, so, and then even at the mayor, like for example, um, you know, the, the the elections that happened this this past two weeks, um, you know, everyone's talking about, oh my God, you know, Michelle Wu became mayor of Boston. You got you know Cincinnati and Seattle, but overall, it's still very rare to see, for example, an Asian American in at least the upper echelons of power. Um, you know, it's very rare, at least outside of California and, and maybe even Texas. And, and so, yeah, the answer is no. Um, what I will say is that there's plenty of groups out there that are dedicated to creating, um, you know, sort of resources and pipelines for Asian candidates. Um, there's a great group called APACS in DC, um, something like congressional studies, but they, they have every year um, a fellowship program they also recruit people to intern in DC offices um, for members of Congress, et cetera. Um, and then there's also a, a new group out there um, focused on Asian American Pacific Islander women um, and having them run for office. So, you know, as far as, you know, how to, how to make more folks run for office, there are already resources out there and people out there trying to make that happen. Um, was there another part to that question? I think that was all. But uh, okay. I think the resources that you share were great. And also there is um, an AAPI vote as well. And they're doing a oh, lot yeah. of work for encouraging um, the Asian American and Pacific Islander community to register to vote and actually turn out of election. So if you're looking for you know voter information on uh, specifically for that community, they're another really great resource and they have a great Twitter page as well. Now I'm gonna get just to get to three more questions, um, but thank you so much for everybody who's com- who has contributed their questions this morning. We've had so many to go through that we're unfortunately not going to get to everybody, but um, this is a great opportunity to really follow up and subscribe to the Yappy as well. So you can get, uh, you know, follow their content and actually see if there's more information. 
Um, so we have another question that came in. Um, in recent years, hostility towards China, Chinese, and Chinese Americans, and unreasonably, um, this hostility has extended to other Asian American groups as well, has increased close, um, has increased close to the level since the 1992 Los Angeles riots and Japanese internment camps during the World War II. How do you think that this would affect the political environment in America, such as treatments to Asian Americans or the changing voter turnouts? Do you think that this hostility would eventually die down or persist for decades to come? Uh, short answer is, I think that, I mean, if you read, okay, there's a great book called um, The Chinese in America by an author named Iris Chang. And it goes back from like the 1850s to current day where it shows, you know, different waves of Chinese immigration. Um, and then, you know, the subsequent, you know, rises in tensions and, and, you know, racism and violence that occur. So technically what we're seeing now is not new. Uh, it's, it's basically a continuity of the cycle. Um, so yes, it will continue to, you know, at least I think in this current cycle, I think it would get worse. Um, for example, um, I think at least in terms of voter turnout, I think that the Chinese American community pays attention and it's probably like a lot of what they talk about. Um, I know that, for example, a lot of APA advocacy groups in DC, um, we care about something called a Trump era program called the China Initiative, which was sort of, um, it was formed to sort of counteract or, or you know, to counter, um, you know, Chinese, intelligence um, activities and sort of op attempts at theft of, of US IP. Um, but that in turn has also created a sort of a net of suspicion on any, any scientist that is Chinese or is Asian. Um, it, it has affected, you know, South Asians as well. Um, so there are a lot of groups working on that um, and trying to end the China initiative because they think it's controversial. It hurts, you know, at least America's standing in the world in terms of attracting Chinese talent. And a lot of the FBI cases um, that have been brought against, for example, Chinese scientists or Chinese immigrant scientists um, have been either very weak and they've been thrown out or, you know, they're controversial in their own right. So, yeah, short answer is I think that it will get worse. And I think it is also a very big mobilizing factor for Chinese voters. And on the note of the role of China, what um, do you have any opinions on China's role in Asian politics currently? Yeah, so it's very interesting because, um, you know, Chinese Americans and, and, you know, folks in China are very different. And I'd say that even China's view of Chinese Americans is, is not very great. Um, so, you know, I think that throughout history, China has viewed sort of Chinese Americans as not Chinese enough. And then Asian, you know, just American general hasn't, hasn't viewed Chinese Americans as American enough. Um, so, there, there is a lot, there, you know, China is responsible for a lot of just the current immigration in the U.S. Um, so obviously the immigrant population, um, you know, those dynamics of just that, that portion of the population is very interesting because, um, for example, you know, my parents are immigrants from, you know, China and Taiwan. They cared very deeply about, you know, inter-China related issues, um, more so than I would ever, you know, I don't really follow that stuff because, you know, I, I'm American. And so seeing that dynamic is very interesting. Um, can I predict anything from it? Not really. Um, everyone's unique. Definitely. And um, when you were speaking on that, it reminded me of the book, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, where they're always talking about the difference between mm -hmm. people who are from mainland China or Chinese American. Yeah. Um, so definitely. Uh, so that's not probably not really related to politics, but it's a really great a visual of kind of sharing those differences. Um, so just two more questions we have for this morning. Um, you discussed about the importance of Asian Americans being together and representing a political and social body that can uplift together and to uplift themselves in their community. How can Asian Americans mesh, uh, mesh the differences between South Asian, East Asian, and Southeast Asian Americans bet to better represent themselves? Um, so I think that it just, I mean, the term Asian American right, it was created as, as I mentioned, as a political tool almost at, to create solidarity. But obviously, you know, labels like Asian American, you know, even the API label that was created in the 1990s, I believe, those are very controversial because, you know, at one hand, they can serve as, as sort of a tool for solidarity and political power. At the same time, they, you know, they can also erase certain populations. For example, you know, when you think of Asian American, most people will think, you know, East Asian, right? Um, and then also Asian Americans have, you know, some of the highest... I think they have the highest income inequality of any community 
or um, in the US. And when you disaggregate the data, which is basically like breaking down the data by, by ethnic group, you know, you'll see very different um, sort of, you know, situations. For example, um, you know, healthcare disparities, educational disparities, just the, just the income inequality is very vast. So when people are like, oh, Asian Americans are doing well, when you actually break down the data, it's more like, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean at the top, and then everyone else is sort of like, you know, it's a vastly, it's a vast distribution. Um, so that is why, yes, I think that, you know, highlighting and, and breaking out and being specific with each, um, you know, group within the Asian American diaspora is very important because, and you know, that's why there's publications like The Juggernaut, which is dedicated to Southeast Asian politics and South Asian politics. Um, and, you know, there, there are very certain set, sets of, you know, communities that also have very different experiences just generationally and how they came to the U.S. So, for example, I'd say, you know, Hmong and Vietnamese Americans, you know, coming as refugees wouldn't have the same experience and, and upbringing and sort of socialization and understanding of America as, for example, you know, Japanese and Chinese and Korean Americans. Um, so just understanding those distinct differences and how we treat them with policy is, is why I think segregated data is very important. And I know that there's pushes, at least on the, on the federal level, to sort of start disaggregating those things. And now just to wrap up, and we have one final question for today. Um, and thank you to everybody who has added their questions to the Q&A. We have so many that we're not going to get to this morning, but we really do appreciate everyone taking the time to write them in. Um, and we're grateful for all the questions we were able to answer this morning as well. Um, so what are some of your hopes and goals for the Yappy in the coming years? And finally, how do you really maintain your own hope? I mean, this work is difficult. As you've spoken at the beginning, it's not just like being engaged in politics, it's really about service. So how do you maintain that hope um, when it seems that there's so much controversial um, and sometimes just terrible things going on in our world? How do you really maintain that hope and keep moving forward? So just those two would be our last final questions for this morning. Okay, sweet. Um, and then I'll just also just to know if you could, can we save the questions from the chat so like I can answer them later, um, even if I can't do it now. Um, okay, so we should be able to. I'll have to ask our uh, Zoom background, but we okay. should be able to. Um, so I think you know, in terms of plans for the Yappy, um, I mean, we're obviously the one thing is like we want to either get nonprofit status or start paying writers. Um, so that's why we're applying to so many grants and you know seeking projects and sort of applying to things just because we want to get that started. Um, so just building the legitimacy is very important, um, not just in terms of just the, the brand image of Yappy, but also just the actual like nonprofit status and how the government and taxes and all that, you know, play out. Um, and then also we've been doing a lot of work on expanding our coverage on certain things. So um, for example, a, a weak spot for us, at least at first, was Pacific Islander activism and reporting on that. Um, so we're trying to do our due diligence in sort of either recruiting for folks um, who understand the community or, you know, highlighting them in more prominently in our coverage. So, you know, for, the, for example, this week we published, I think last week we published a newsletter um, highlighting Pacific Islanders at COP2026 um, and how, how their, their concerns are going out there. Um, and then in terms of, what was the second part of the question? How do you maintain hope? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's two parts to it. I think it's one, like the app is, I think a team of like 10 or, 10 or more people now. Um, when we started, it was only me and, and the other Andrew. Um, so it, it has gotten a lot more, um, I get more company is what I'll say. Um, and, and people, obviously when people's energies feed off of each other, it's really great because, you know, when they're, when they're involved and sort of passionate about something, I get passionate about something that excitement feeds off itself. And then also, I think the thing that keeps me going is also the fact that there have been so many wild opportunities that have come from Yappy that I've never would have sort of, I wouldn't, I would never get the opportunity, for example, to, to speak to Jen Saki at the White House, um, a White House press briefing if it hadn't been for Yappy. Um, things like, you know, meeting members of Congress, interviewing folks, you know, candidates, so many interesting folks out there um, who, who really want their stories out there but have no other places to, to sort of tell them. You know, getting to see that and getting to experience that is really great. And then also just supporting, you know, the Asian American journal, Asian API journalists in general, right? Um, because there aren't that many publications out there. 
when they pitch their work to mainstream publications, uh, it's a very high bar and one that you know a lot of editors, at least in mainstream publications, have a certain view of Asian Americans. So that's going to affect just the the approval process for that. And so hopefully, um, I think that we've demonstrated we can be a home to those types of stories, um, and that's what keeps me going. So sort of a summary is just you know obviously the people, it's it's the passion as well. Um, sort of just egged on by a lot of you know, crazy opportunities along the way. And then um, just, you know, the fact that I think that what we're doing is really impactful. Definitely. And I think that's such a wonderful way to close out our event today. Um, really just harnessing your passions and, you know, finding others that are also passionate about that work can really be extremely invaluable. And I wanted to say a very, very big thank you to Andrew Pang for joining us this morning at our Gambaccini Lecture Series. Um, I also want to give a huge thank you to our co-sponsors, so the Rutgers Asian American Cultural Center, Rutgers Division of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, Rutgers Center for Social Justice, Education, and LGBT Communities, and the Rutgers School of Communication and Information. Also a huge shout out to Professor Stacy Green's class who was able to join us this morning. For everybody who was able to add questions to our Q&A and also to the Eagleton Institute of Politics and the Gambaccini family for sponsoring and um, supporting this event this morning. Um, we are really, really thankful for everyone who were able to join us. Um, and please feel free to um, follow and subscribe to the Yappy um, and connect with them on social media as well. So we can uplift their work, their incredible work even more. Uh, thank you so much um, and have a great morning. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you.